Live from Cambridge, Massachusetts, extracting the signal from the noise, it's The Cube, covering the MIT Chief Data Officer and Information Quality Symposium. Now your hosts, Dave Vellante and Paul Gillen. Gillen, this is theCUBE, SiliconANGLE Wikibon's coverage of MIT IQ. We're pleased to have Bob Picciano here. Bob is the Senior Vice President at IBM, CUBE alum. Bob, great to see you again. <laughs> great to see you, Dave. So coming great off the here. keynote, you know, a lot of energy, as we're saying, you know, the focus conference, a lot of chief data officers. We didn't get to see your keynote because we were doing CUBE interviews. <laughs> Take us through what were your key messages and what was it like? Well, you know, first off, we've been involved with the Chief Data Officer community for some time, and it's been amazing to see the role uh, transform. And uh, a part of my message was really, um, they're in a catbird seat in terms of helping organizations really transform. Uh, and it's about innovation. Um, and so, uh, one of my messages was, you know, don't be a curator, don't help solve the conflicts of, you know, who has the rights to data, how to integrate the data, how to just, you know, focus on the governance that's necessary to really have a high quality data-driven enterprise. Really focus on that transformation. Understand how to be a leader in transforming your industry in the market. Serve roles and professions in your business in a different way using the advanced capabilities of machine learning and predictive analytics, which are being consumerized. Um, and, uh, and really think deeply about how you're going to change that space of engagement for your business. Um, whether that's direct to the client or citizen, whether that is for the employee, so that they're more connected to the, to the brand strategy and represent the brand in a way that really allows you to, to perform and outperform your peers, but really transforming the efficacy of their role, which is where advanced capabilities like cognitive computing really come into play, because many roles were really missed by previous generations of IT innovations because of the amount of unstructured data that many roles depend upon. Lawyers, doctors, um, you know, you think about uh, you know, several uh, really important roles in you know, our economy that really did not derive the benefit from my, you know, prior generations of IT transformation. And of course, you know, I really talked about this in the backdrop of what I see occurring where the value of IT in, in terms of business is really reaching an inflection point where in previous generations it was about codifying business process in the form of applications and industrializing the way businesses perform tasks to now the inflection point is deriving insight from all of these different applications and all the disparate data and data that exists outside the company firewall. And really the value of IT is going to be really delivering uh, its impact through the insight it's going to deliver on top of the internal and external information. You know, you made an interesting comment in your, your closing remarks. You said everybody talks about consumerization of IT. It's really the consumerization of business. Yeah. And that data role is really changing organizations, right. driving toward much more consumer-like experiences. At IBM, you guys do more technology than anybody, but you talk business outcomes. You're a geek at heart, and, and I mean that in a nice way. <laughs> um, and yet, you're in a position at your company and you talk about business outcomes all the time. How is the consumerization of, of organizations changing, uh, how is data changing the role of organizations from a consumerization standpoint? It's a tremendous question. Uh, and what I see occurring is that the best organizations are really transforming to be data driven, much more deeply data driven. Um, and you know, Christopher Mims from the Wall Street Journal wrote a nice piece in the spring of this year and he commented that data is becoming the new middle manager and that the better organizations were creating a transparency but also a freedom to act and interact around the data in a way that really empowered people with more confidence in decision making. Um, and you know, Christopher and I talked about how I see things like Watson Analytics really helping fuel that transformation much faster than anyone will think is possible because it allows people to interact with their data using natural language so they can express their business problem or challenge in natural text, and that it applies machine learning to the laborious task of integrating disparate data, improving data quality, and also being able to create predictions on the data 
without the individual having to be a data scientist. Now, the consumerization element also occurs that we're putting that in the palm of your hand. And so our partnership with leading companies like Apple allows us to really transform all the different professions that can derive a benefit from that level of data insight in the palm of their hand without really being sort of uh, sequenced into an IT decision-making chain. To what degree is Watson going to drive your analytics strategy going forward? Is that really the engine underneath uh, IBM Analytics? It's a, it's a critically important engine uh, because it's a, you know, a whole new field of innovation that unlocks the potential for that IT value to help transform professions that haven't really been affected in a, in a really productive way by, uh, by computing. Would I be, so, I'm sorry. So, so I say it is a very important element of it. We're still in the early stages of, of ramping and scaling that business, and we're doing that with an ecosystem approach, as well as a, you know, a, a key approach working directly with clients and also with client partners. Um, and then bringing Watson into specific industries like Watson Health um, to really help look at how that industry is struggling with all of the personalized medicine and unstructured data. So, but still, you know, 80% of the problem in really being proficient in analytics is still relating to master data quality, entity extraction, data integration. So, applying advanced machine learning into those spaces might not necessarily be formally categorized as Watson, but it's still a very important driver. And as you know, in the second quarter, our analytics business grew at 20%. You know, last year we exited at 17 billion. First quarter we grew at over 20%. So we're growing about, you know, really about six times, you know, five to six times faster than the market, already being the number one player so on a business that scale. Story that, that didn't seem to make it into most of the media coverage, I noticed. And, and uh, why is that? I mean, why is that analytics story not getting out there? Well, look, I mean, I think many times the story is told by you know, people who really focus on you know, what is that top line, more retail oriented story. And if you look at IBM, you know, we've been transforming by you know, moving ourselves from what were commodity oriented businesses uh, that occupied some component of our portfolio, seven billion that generated 500 million in, in loss uh, on an annual basis. Um, we exited those businesses, so people see that as a top line reduction in revenue, and now we're investing both the gains of that as well as our own restructuring efforts into our strategic comparative growth areas. Those represented about 25% of IBM last year. Our goal is to have those represent 40% of the IBM company uh, in, uh, in 2018. And so we're well on that journey. And the growth we saw in cloud at 70% and analytics um, are just you know, some of the elements showing that the progress of those strategic comparative growth areas where our investors really should focus their attention is working. Bob, you're talking about Watson, um and industry specificity, and you got some questions around that. Yeah. Uh, we've talked in the past about, you have libraries of, of analytics by, by industry, but analytics generally, and I guess machine learning specifically, is, tends to be highly customized. Are we getting to the point, are we, are we, can we see the light at the end of the tunnel where you can start to package those capabilities into applications, you know, maybe, maybe industry specificity, and sort of reduce some of that complexity for customers? Without question. Uh, and in fact, you're touching on the actual technique we use in our Watson Analytics uh, offering on the cloud, where we identify those uh, statistical patterns and implement them in a way that, as a general pattern, then they can be applied to an industry or to a particular data set. And when you look at Watson, Watson really has evolved as a system of systems. Um, you know, around uh, around discovery and around engagement and around uh, you know evaluating the data and and uh, allowing for interactions around dialogue um, and those systems all use a wide array of different machine learning techniques that have all been tailored for a particular industry or a particular data set. So there's about 50 very specific machine learning algorithms that are that are exhausted by Watson as it solves its problems. And you know most systems, you know, will use one or two machine learning techniques, and we're really using a you know wide array that are purpose built for that industry or that domain. And that also comes out in the way that we train Watson based on ontological approaches and the vocabulary of the industry we want it to serve. And so, you know, as we look at really where we're going to have the highest impact in this inflection point, it's important to put it all in the context of the industry and the domain and to have uh, a set of capabilities that really focuses in 
on, you know, say financial services and asset performance of financial services. There's also asset performance in an industrial or manufacturing sense, but that's a different asset. And you're looking at the behavior of a machine versus maybe the behavior of an investor or an equity. And so, yeah, different machine learning techniques, same words, um, but they need to be applied in a system that can be, um, you know, flexible, agile across both use cases. So I mean, I would think that's fundamental and critical to IBM's strategy because you're essentially open source is creating a slow motion collapse of a lot of infrastructure software to the extent that you can package solutions and add value. You're going to you know, make you know, make more money. You're going to drive more value, and you're going to get more repeat customers. I mean, is that? Well, fair assessment? It is uh, spot on, as uh, you guys always are in terms of your insights, and it's really you know, the underpinning to why we were, uh, I think, aggressively and openly supporting Spark. Because as a platform for helping democratize more skills involvement in the journey of advanced analytics, and for a technology platform that supports uh, the potential to do much more distributed parallel machine learning, we saw that as a great promise. You know, sort of in the same way that Java helped really scale uh, the notion of e-business and web development, we see that uh, Spark has the opportunity to do the same thing around, around analytics, and not just the analytics space, but also operationally, because in an in-memory context, it can do some things that, from an, operation, from an operational standpoint, really aren't plausible in a Hadoop context today. So it's also why we donated the system ML innovations where now machine learning can be patterned and scaled across, you know, MapReduce architectures in a more effective way. So. I, I want to. I want to. I don't want to let go of, of uh, Watson just yet. Okay. Would IBM ever conceivably open source Watson? No, <laughs> but you know what we are doing is having an open developer ecosystem, and so you know the notion of uh, of aspects of any of the Watson intellectual property around, you know, how it learns and how it evolves. That's you know fairly important intellectual property as you can imagine but developing an open platform so that developers can utilize Spark as well as our behavioral based uh, APIs as well as our um, engagement advisor APIs to develop their own applications without having to you know, really pay us a commercial contract up front. And then as you know, they develop their application, as they introduce it to the market, as they succeed, then that's where our commercial relationship, you know, bears a benefit for both them so and for us. So you'll keep the barriers low, but you but you would not you wouldn't open source the platform. Uh, absolutely, and I think a lot of people don't understand that Watson has been very innovative in terms of developing the ecosystem. There's a blue mix Watson developer zone, mm -hmm. and in that developer zone, you can find the highly sophisticated but easily consumable APIs that allow people to develop cognitive applications that allow them to develop you know, applications on top of our open data platform, Big Insights, that utilize predictive analytics, advanced time series, space time boxes for Internet of Things. There's a whole Internet of Things foundation that's available on, on Bluemix. That's also being utilized by device manufacturers to authenticate and register their devices into a trusted platform for them to share information and data about the products and services that those devices are embedded into. And so Bluemix has really started to expand rapidly as an open innovation platform for developers that are differentiated by analytics, differentiated by uh, cognitive and predictive, and by the maturity of having business process support by you know, the, the disciplines that IBM has developed over many years. So we have a question from the crowd here. We're running a crowd chat at uh, okay. crowdchat.net slash MITIQ. And the question Bob relates to, and I know you're super busy, all the CDOs want to talk to you, I know you got you to gotta run, so I want to get this in before you got to go. Somebody at CrowdChat's saying, ask about data silos in real time, yeah. and there's a lag in the data depending on the freshness of the data and the access to the data, and the silos are a yeah. challenge there. How uh, is the industry generally, and IBM specifically, addressing that? Problem? So, a very, very important point, because you know, especially as you start to look at the internet of things, um, and really what's going to differentiate you know, company and, and organizational performance, it's really going to be a, around fast, actionable insights. And those data silos really put a huge amount of, uh, of time lag into an organization's ability to act with confidence. It may be because they might have to integrate a certain set of data with a trusted customer profile, and that is going to take uh, amount of time because it's done in a batch orientation today. Right, it might mean that 
uh, predictive analytics is going to be applied to try to get some aspect of how to prescribe the action based on what's occurring. And that, in many instances, only happens in a batch-oriented process today, or it has to be moved to another database. Um, and the fact that much of the data that's going to be generated at the edge of the network is going to lose its value within a few milliseconds. About 60% of the data is going to lose its value within a few milliseconds. So the, your, uh, your viewer's got a great, great question. And we see that there is actually an important element of a real-time analytics zone. That's the convergence of complex event processing and advanced predictive analytics inside of an event stream. Spark helps with that as well, but it, it, it doesn't necessarily, it's more of a micro-batch capability. It, it's happening in a in-memory context, so it does it very, very quickly, but it doesn't have the level of sophistication of logic branching, bloom filtering, things that you might need to do as you integrate various sources of data to gain the insight, recurse and iterate around certain patterns, and then take action in an operational decision fabric. Because the other thing that your, your viewer is also pointing out is that the anal analytics, analytics have separated from the operational system, derives no value. Mm. So what does it really mean if somebody at a desktop gets an alert that something has to happen, they have to run down the hall and plug it into the programmatic system of record for it to affect the value. So chaining those things together is that aspect of complex event processing with advanced analytics. And that's what the Infosphere Streams project has been about. And that project actually is converging to some extent with more open Java mechanisms of developing in streams language, and also with the work that we're doing with Spark. But a great question. So that's a vision of the, the, the systems of record a actually extending to accommodate. Being incorporated directly into yeah. the, the insight and uh, being able to take actionable insight. Not retiring them, not oh, putting them in the old bucket. <laughs> yep, so it's data silos yeah. and it's system silos. Right. You know, systems of engagement and things that are doing the data collection can't be far removed from the systems of record where people are taking the trusted action that represent uh, you know, the processes of the enterprise. So, uh, great question. Uh, the, the, uh, this is a CDO conference, and uh, I, the, there's a lot of talk about how the CDO role will develop vis-a-vis -vis yeah. the CIO role. What is Bob Picciano's view on that? Okay, as I said to the audience today, um, you know, I think the CDOs are in the catbird seat. Um, and you know, I know initially that you know, many of them were educated by saying, you know, these organizations don't work together, get them to work together. You know, people think they own the data, you own the data, figure out how it works together. You know, part of my message, and I think, you know, I saw a lot of nodding heads, so I think people are really on this, is, you know, don't be a curator, be an innovator, right? Be a disruptor. Think about not just the, the, the role in how, you know, data and cloud and engagement are going to be transformative for a business, but, you know, use that position of power. You're at that C-suite. Right? You're helping paint that journey map of how you know, your company's data is really going to be transformative in the company performance. I also encourage them to think partnerships. Um, that you know, in many instances, um, the exogenous data, the data that exists outside of their company, whether it's sentiment or climate or weather, atmospheric quality, whether it's open data that comes from municipalities, whether there's data that relates to you know, fraudulent activity that they need to bring in from syndication or you know, media related data. Incorporating that data with confidence with the rest of their data is going to be a core discipline. So I encourage them to think about partnerships and partner with companies that can not just bring the data, but can bring insights about that data so it's much more consumable. And, uh, and really to, uh, to focus on um, you know, finding a way to, to truly innovate for the industry, not just for their company, but to be a fellow, so to speak, in how they impacted the industry from that position. Well, you've got some experience there. You've done some weather partnerships, you've done a partnership with Twitter. Box, when I first saw this, oh, cloud deal. But it's actually, it was an analytics driven deal. Can you explain that deal? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, first off, I think people were surprised because, you know, if you were to step back and look at this from 50,000 feet, you may think at a macro level, you know, Box and IBM were competing. In fact, when Aaron and I got together and first talked, we said, you know, we're in the same companies, but we actually are in, in different places. And where they were incredibly powerful is really in that interpersonal relationship of people with revisable form data, editable content, that were really trying to work and collaborate and share, work and collaborate and share. And we were doing work at the more enterprise level about how that content needed to be linked together around an enterprise process that you know, looked at case management, that looked at defensible disposal, that looked at self-service uh, uh, you know, content generation. And we said, look, what organizations really need to do is they need to bring these worlds together. And if somebody's doing something over here in an important collaborative pattern, 
Uh, we want to bring those things together, and we want to open up um, the, uh, you know, with, of course, the, the customer consent, we want to open up the ability to help those companies analyze that data and glean insights from that data because the, the richer that content, the harder it is to analyze it. So it's not just the textual information, not just the spreadsheets, but images and video. And we have advanced analytics that can help Box improve their value proposition because they would be able to help people really gain insights from all that edge-oriented content. So it has been a collaboration of analytics around securing the information in a meaningful way, around process integration, and really creating enterprise and industry vertical specific solutions around that process, around collaboration and work that we're doing around IBM Verse and IBM Connections. So people have enterprise social integration between what's happening with Box and what's happening with their existing IBM collaboration systems. And of course one around cloud, where we're also helping them bridge that barrier to entry in international geographies where data sanctions and data regulations uh, really specify that the cloud data center has to be in their country and the data can't leave there. And IBM has the answer to that with the way that we're running our soft layer infrastructure and globally dispersing our data centers. There's no question that IBM, there's a pattern to IBM's recent alliances, Apple, Facebook, Twitter, Box, clearly the company partnering with some of the uh, some of the hottest web scale companies out there. What criteria are, I mean, is there a, is there a, a bigger plan or a bigger message here with, of with, with creating these <laughs> partnerships? Yeah, of course there is, look, I mean, it's all about data and cloud and engagement. You know, all of these companies have an important cross section, intersection, of you know, an interesting vector of data, whether it's Dave Kenny at the Weather Company, who did um, just a tremendous job. Another partnership, that's another right. Another partnership, where um, you know, they're mapping the atmosphere in the same way that companies like Esri and Google mapped uh, the Earth. Now the atmosphere is a lot harder to map because it's constantly moving, it's in three-dimensional space, and there's many things that you have to track in it, not just the weather, but it's you know different strata of air patterns and movements, uh, you know air density, but also pollutants, pollen, all the atmospheric quality, and you have to do that on a global scale continuously. Um, and so that's an important vector of information that people can use in real time as a competitive advantage uh, in real time systems that have to do with power generation, alerting around insurance, uh, you know asset damage potentially. Um, customer churn is greatly affected by weather patterns in the atmosphere. So. Interesting component of, web, of data vector, could be sentiment with Twitter, could be content with Box. Cloud-centric, so doing it at a web scale. And that really affects the way people feel like they're being engaged by a brand or a consumer. If you think you, know, you understand my sentiment and you can respond to my intuition about what I need next because you understand that and you have a view of my behavior, then you're going to be my preferred supplier of products and services. You know, about, you, you've been very generous at the time, but I got one last question before we let you go. You had it's been a big year for you guys. You have had, had waves. So we saw you in January when you're bringing transaction and analytics together, with the, the Z announcement. Uh, in the spring, you guys brought Watson Analytics to the to the BI space. The You kicked off the summer with a Spark initiative. Yep. And, then, and you've got IBM Insight coming up in, in the fall. Yep. What can we expect? Can you show us a little leg? <laughs> you know, what can you tell us about? You You'll know, be the first to know, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a little early to go in that, but clearly, you know, this, this is a, a fast moving, very determined, very focused, very committed transformation for IBM. Uh, and, uh, you know, yeah, it's been a year, but for me it seems like a week. Time is going by and the scale of uh, our, our engagement with our clients and our partners has been tremendous. So I'm grateful for all of their involvement uh, and really for the great collaborations, uh, but really grateful for the problems that our clients continue to bring to us, the most ambitious, hardest challenges. Um, so in the fall, you might see the story told through more of our customers' eyes. Um, and you know, really the, the fruits of some of these innovations uh, as well as some some new things that uh, that we you know we're going to unveil as uh, as we get closer to the fall time. I mean, have you got a couple of blockbusters up your sleeve? Or should we expect something hey, big? Talking about IBM here. What do you <laughs> think? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Bob. Well, listen. Congratulations on the business momentum. You know, keep it up. We'll be watching. And uh, thanks for Thank coming back. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate you having me. Thank All right, you keep it right you. there, everybody. Yep. We'll be back with our next guest right after this. This is the Cube. We're live in Cambridge, Mass. Right back.